This passage from Luke's gospel, this parable of the widow and the unjust judge, came to mind very clearly for me in 1989. I was in Japan at the time. I was visiting a friend from college, and the second time I went to Japan, I went on the same train the same way and looked out the window, and I could not see Mount Fuji. A lot of people who live in Japan never see Mount Fuji because it's always, most of the time, shrouded in clouds. But the first time I went, I really wanted to see Mount Fuji. And on the train ride by it, we couldn't see it. But then my friend said, what we're going to do, we're going to take a taxi up another volcano. $245 taxi ride up a volcano. Usually Japanese people are nothing but polite and respectful, but the cab driver thought we were nuts. He kept saying, it's not going to happen, you're not going to see it, you're not going to see it. And I remember this parable, and I kept saying, please, God, please, I'm going to be persistent like the widow. Please, God, please, God, please, God, please, I want to see Mount Fuji, I want to see Mount Fuji, please let me see Mount Fuji, please, Lord, let me see Mount Fuji, I really got to see Mount Fuji. Suddenly, we popped through the cloud cover, and we pulled off on an area where people were also gazing at Mount Fuji. And I got out of the cab, and I cried out, oh, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is thy name in all the earth. And I was dancing around doing my Mount Fuji happy dance to the point that I looked and a whole busload full of Japanese people were taking my picture and laughing at me. <laughs> Mount Fuji is absolutely the most beautiful thing I've seen in the world. And people say to me, well, then you haven't seen the United States. Let me tell you, God made the US and God made Japan. God made every beautiful thing on this planet. But how many of you have been to Japan and seen Mount Fuji? Anybody else here seen it? It is a perfect cylinder of, not a cylinder, what's that? I, I'm losing my mind today. I tell you what, I am tired from this weekend. It's conical, that's what it is. It's a perfect conical shape. It's teal, it's blue, turquoise with snow on top. It is absolutely breathtaking. And I thanked God profusely for it, but that's not what this parable is about. Because if we take it as, if I just nag God, I'll get what I want, we miss the parable completely although I did nag God and I got what I wanted. Don't take that as an uh, example of anything other than praying fervently for something that you need or want. But when Jesus told this parable, this was a real knee slapper. People would have been laughing hysterically when he told this story because it makes no sense whatsoever. A widow at the time of Jesus had no power at all. The most powerless person in this society would have been a widow because a widow would have been completely dependent upon a son if she had one to support her after her husband died. A daughter would have been no good at all to her in terms of supporting her. She would have been starving to death. They would have been in the streets had she only had daughters. And lots of times when we're talking about widows, we're not talking about elderly women, we're talking about young women with families. So if she had no son to protect her, she would have to rely on people doing the right thing. And how many of you would like to rely your life and your livelihood on people doing the right thing? Because the law said, you shall care for the widow and the fatherless, you shall care for the orphan, you shall care for the sojourner in your midst. So the idea of a widow going to a judge, and not just a judge, a corrupt judge, who had all sorts of power and took advantage of people, going and demanding her rights and him giving in to her would have been laughable. Especially what he says, although I have no respect for people and no fear of God, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will grant her justice so that she may not wear me out with continually coming. Wear me out was literally a boxing term in those days. It's like this widow's gonna beat my head in. This widow's gonna knock me out, TKO. It would have been, they would have laughed at this story. But Jesus tells this story because he wants us to pray without giving up. And that's what we're talking about today, to pray without ceasing. Last week it was rejoice always. Now if you remember October, we did stewardship. Moving into November, we're doing giving thanks. And today is the end of the Christian year. Today is the festival of Christ who is the king and the judge of all times and of all people. But I do think these lessons fit very well with that as well. To pray without ceasing means to have a conversation with God, to have a two-way conversation with God. Sometimes we look at prayer like we look at Santa Claus, and we're coming up on that time yet. I didn't ask the kids up here this morning. Let me ask you now. How many of you have your Christmas lists made out? Yep. I knew that would happen. Oh, somewhat back there. There's somebody. Jeremiah, you've got things to add, right? Looks like. Okay. Basic stuff might be down, but not everything. 
How many of you grown-ups have been making out your Christmas lists as well? Thank you, Paul, for being honest and sharing back there. They're going, yes, we've made out our Christmas list. But don't we pray that way sometimes? God, give me, 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 in Jesus' name, amen. That's not how we're called to pray. We're called to pray in a way that has a conversation with God, which means we wait for an answer, not just wait to get what we want, which is why I said my Mount Fuji story, although I prayed without ceasing, is not a good example for this. And if you read the story just basically like, if you nag God to get what you want, you miss the power of the story. We're called to pray without ceasing, meaning there is nothing we cannot take to God. There have been times since I've been in the ministry where children will raise their hand during the joys and concerns and share a joy like, I got a new frog. And we all say, amen, thanks be to God. Or when they say, my dog is sick. And someone said to me once, why do you let these children mess up the prayer time with all these crazy things? And I said, because they're taking what they have in their hearts to God, and I will never, ever do anything to discourage that. Because there is nothing too unimportant to take to God. And there is nothing that God will not receive. But sometimes we talk to God as a one-way ticket, and we don't wait for an answer. Not necessarily the answer to what we ask for, and sometimes we think if we don't get what we want, we've been answered with a big fat no. But to ask God, not just what we need, and most of you I know, don't pray as hard for yourselves as you do for other people. Your intercessions are for people you love who are sick, who are hurting, who are destitute. But we are allowed to pray for yourselves as well. But when you pray, even if you're praying for someone else, if someone you love is sick, say, what would you have me do, Lord? Or if you're praying for the world, for peace among people, for justice, as we're told here to pray for God's justice, especially in these days when racial justice is in such short supply, what we're called to do is to say, what would you have me do in response to this, Lord? And wait, and God will answer you. I promise you, God will answer you if you say, what is it that you're asking of me, Lord? That's how I ended up here this morning, because at some crazy point in my life, I said, God, what would you have me do? And God said, I want you to be ordained. And when I stopped laughing, because I thought that was the greatest joke I'd ever heard, I started the process for ordination in the United Methodist Church. Now, I'm going to ask you, because what did it say on the other passage from James? If you're sick, call the elders together, have them pray, have them anoint you. And then it says here, what does it say? Confess your sins to one another. So who wants to go first? Who wants to come up and start confessing? Nobody's raised a hand. I'm surprised. Don't worry, I'm not going to call on you to do that as well. But what we need to do is confess to ourselves and confess to God the lack of prayer time we have. Now, the folks at the 9 o'clock service were pretty forthcoming. I asked them, how many of you remember to pray every day? Or do you pray at a regular time? That's a good way to start if you need to increase your prayer life. Is there anyone here who doesn't think your prayer life needs to get better? Raise your hand and then we will ask you to come up and confess your sins. No, we will not do that. But don't we all need to get more, more intent with our prayer lives? I've told people the first thing I pray in the morning is, my thanks to God. I have a litany of thanks that I give to God every morning. Thank you for my baptism and place in your church. Thank you for sending Jesus Christ to be the Savior of the world and my Savior. Those are my first two prayers of the day, unless I have to go to the bathroom. Then sometimes I'm driving to church and I go, oh, I didn't pray, and I will pray it then. Sometimes it's after dinner at night and I go, oh, I didn't pray this morning, but I will always give thanks to God every day of my life. But I need to pray more. Hearing a siren is a good opportunity to pray. We were talking about this, and a siren went by the church, some emergency vehicle, stop and pray for the person who needs help and the person going to give help. That's a good reminder. Some people pray better without words. Some people pray with images. I lead a contemplative photography retreat for the annual conference on years without COVID. People learn to pray with a camera in their hand or with a paintbrush in their hand. People can pray doing all sorts of things. It's learning to see God around you. It's learning to experience God. Some of you pray so well singing, and I do miss singing. And I hope to heavens you turn my microphone off when I sing, because since COVID, I have lost my voice. I am a soprano. Now I'm moving toward basso profundo, because my voice keeps going lower and lower and lower. I can't hit notes anymore. 
I missed that. That was a great way to pray for me. How many of you find yourself singing your faith to God in the car, in the shower, in the morning? You need to pray more. If we prayed more as a congregation, the place would be overflowing. If we prayed more to ask God what we could do to make the world a better place, the world would change. But you got to talk to God, and you got to understand it's a two-way conversation, and you have to wait for the answer, and God will give it to you. Prayer is also not an ultimatum, though. i got to tell you that. Once, before I was a pastor, someone came to me whose son had a congenital birth defect. She had been warned after her first child not to try again, but she wanted to try again, and her baby was born with a damaged liver and told me when the doctor said, don't expect him to live to be one year old. But she prayed, and if God would save her son, she would believe. If not, she'd never set foot in a church again, and her son died. I don't know what the remainder of her life was with her faith, but I prayed for her at that time that she might find the strength to go on no matter what happened. Now, it does say here that we're supposed to anoint each other with oil and pray for each other, and the prayers of the righteous have effect. You are the righteous. Don't tell me you're not righteous. That's an easy way to get off the hook for doing this. We are the people who are seeking to be in a good relationship with God. We're seeking Christ above all else. We're called then to use that power that God gives us for each other. But there are unfortunately times when we pray so hard for someone to continue to live and that person doesn't live. And I know that from my own personal experience so very well. People said when my husband was in his last days, I'm praying for him to be made well. We knew that wasn't going to happen. And I said, don't pray for that. Pray for strength. We need strength. And I can tell you honestly that I know when people pray for me because I feel that power in my life and in my work. Now, one of my favorite movies of all time, it's one that makes me cry every time I see it, is called Shadowlands. Anyone seen that one? It's probably 30 years old now. Anthony Hopkins, Deborah Winger. Anthony Hopkins plays C.S. Lewis, the great British theologian. He wrote uh, Mere Christianity. He wrote The Screwtape Letters. He wrote a number of books, one called A Grief Observed, which is what this movie is about. He also wrote The Chronicles of Narnia. The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, all those books that are allegories about our faith in Jesus Christ. But he married late in life. He married an American woman. It was a marriage of convenience, they both thought, until they fell in love with each other. And after they fell in love, she was diagnosed with cancer and did not live very long and lived a very brutal, short battle with cancer and died. Now, in the movie, he says these words, and some people debate whether he actually said them in his life, but there are others who say he said them and they're contained in other words in his writings. What he said about prayer is, I pray because I cannot help myself. I pray because I am helpless. I pray because the need flows out of me all the time, waking or sleeping. I do not pray to change God. Prayer changes me. We're not trying to bring God onto our side when we pray. We're not trying to convince God that what we ask for is righteous and just and we should have it. But we are called to pray without ceasing. If you want to have a Thanksgiving this week that is filled with grace and love and peace, start praying now. Don't make it a quickie prayer over the turkey. Don't make it good bread, good meat, good God, let's eat, which I have heard at church dinners before because people don't want the gravy to get cold. But on this day of Thanksgiving, and usually I have a Thanksgiving morning service, but without Elaine this year to do the music, we decided we would wait, and next year we will do that on Thanksgiving morning. I've had a service for years. I tell people, come in your nighty, come in your sweatsuit, come in your apron, I don't care. People have come literally in all sorts of attire at 8 o'clock in the morning, and we say our Thanksgiving to God, and we go back to make the gravy and the turkey and everything else. But do not be so busy on the day of giving thanks that you forget to pray to God. Don't be so busy watching football and cutting the pie and putting on the Cool Whip that you forget what the day is set aside for in our nation. It's a day of thanksgiving. It's a day of praise. It's a day of honoring God who is the source of all that we have and ever hope to be. Take time to pray. Pray without ceasing. 
You will see a change in your life, I promise you, like you have never known before. I hope the need flows out of you, waking or sleeping. And if it does not change God's mind, that's not what prayer is for. Prayer is to get us closer to God, that we might be changed more into God's image in Jesus Christ our Lord. So rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and in all circumstances give thanks to God, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Amen.